So I gave birth to Jack at the end of September and I had signed up for the Boston Marathon in April. And it's kind of your classic like first kid optimism. And I make a ton of jokes about this on my, in my social media now. All right. So I don't know about you guys, but I need to be entertained, number one. And if it's mom humor, I'm all about it. And if it's runner humor about it, and if it's mom and runner humor, I'm I'm definitely about it. <laughs> and that's kind of how I found uh, Laura Green, who's on Instagram is Laura McGreen. Um, and I asked her to be on the podcast a couple months ago, and now she's everywhere blowing it up with um, my favorite reel was the Brooks reel. We'll dive into that in a second. But Laura Green, thank you for coming on the show. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for having me. So you are a mom of two. Yes. yes. How, old are your, how old are your kiddos? They are four and one and a half. Okay. So you're in it. I'm in the weeds. <laughs> I'd probably call it shit, but you know, we can call it weedy shit, whatever you want. <laughs> it's all totally. good. But you've been totally. a runner since like, like forever, right? Because your family, they're all runners. You ran in high school, you ran in college. Um, it's kind of a thing. Um, it's a it's <laughs> like it's more than a it's thing. A thing. It's, I mean, like growing up, so my maiden name is McCluskey, hence Mick Green. Um, but so the McCluskeys were the running family. I mean, there's five mm. kids and four of the five were runners. And so, and remember like when I was in high school, when I was in high school, <laughs> um, there was no, yeah. And so yeah. it was like newspaper clippings were a big yes. deal. And then we had a local news station. And so they would do sports, like high school sports. Um, and so those were your two mediums for like, if you got attention. And so if we were in the newspaper, like our races were on Saturday, if we were on the paper on Sunday, it was such a big deal. It was really fun. It's huge. Um, yeah. So like the McCluskeys were kind of in a lot of those places because Does your mom run. No, no, not at all. Ah, My mom. Okay like a foot shorter than the rest of us. I'm actually the shortest in my family and I'm 5'10". So yeah, I have a really tall Did you family. play basketball? Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. That makes a little bit more sense. Okay. Yeah. I was like, I was like, why didn't they recruit you there? Oh yeah. No. Okay. Yeah, I did. Um, but yeah, it's, it, we were just kind of like those crazy runners. Um, because we followed my brother who was the oldest and we just was, all followed too. Yeah. Is that how you ended up? And, and so, so an extra layer here, you're also a physical therapist. Mm -hmm. What, what, what area do you practice in? So right now, nowhere, but okay. up until September, um, I've been doing actually, okay. So I graduated PT school and I was a traveler. So me and my best oh, friend okay. were all over the map and we did everything. Of course you do whatever the job is. Um, which was a lot of snips, a little bit of outpatient, um, and then a little bit of acute rehab. And then we were both home health PTs for like seven years. Um, and I loved that because it was so flexible. Yeah. And I've always had like a second job, like a second creative job. So I would do PT for like 30 hours a week and then another job. Um, and then the pandemic hit, I was home with my kid for like eight months. And then I didn't want to go back to home health because I don't know, I, maybe I just want to switch it up, but the hospital to me felt more sterile. So there's a great hospital. That's a 10 minute walk from, my Oh, house. that's super. And convenient. the smaller community hospital, like, cause Boston obviously has the major, major, yep. huge hospitals. And I wanted something a little bit more manageable. So this is a community hospital and it's awesome. And so I was there for a couple of years until I like, now I'm taking a break, but, um, so I was just doing acute care. Um, gotcha. yeah. But either yeah. way, like somebody would look at you on paper and be like, Oh, she's a runner. Her family is a bunch of runners. Um, she's a PT. And like when she becomes a mom, like, Oh my gosh, she's going to know everything about running and pregnancy and postpartum and all that stuff. Um, <laughs> is that what happened or not so much? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, PT is so interesting because yeah, like we're all PTs and we have a general knowledge of all the different specialties. Yeah. We are no way experts of all the specialties. And yeah. so when it comes to women's health and pelvic floor PT, like I think I took one class on that in college. 
<laughs> oh, you, you had a class. I had nothing. Like I, oh, I do yeah. not, I, I don't, I'm trying to remember if we even had, I don't even think we had a guest speaker with, but the only irony is in gross anatomy. You know, when you, you, you go out in your groups and you, you get assigned the body part. I was so pissed because my got my group got assigned the genitalia. And like when, when, when you're going to be a PT, you want, you want the shoulder, you want the hip, you want something cool. Like we had to come up with some sort of like creative representation of a penis and like uterus. And I think we did like Easter eggs or something. We dressed up my friend as the human fallopian tube. Like that was the only joy I got out of that because I'm like, who wants the genitalia? <laughs> who wants the pelvic floor? Irony of all ironies. <laughs> I mean, I <laughs> it's now my day job. Wait, and also like, this is how out of touch I am. When we were in school, it was women's health PT, but we don't call it that anymore, right? It's just pelvic floor PT. So funny story. That's my third child. So I, I have two kids. Okay. And in the middle of all this, um, I served on, um, I was eventually president. Well, well long story. Um, and my third child was taking five years to get the name changed to be more inclusive mm -hmm. from the section on women's health to the Academy of Pelvic Health Physical Therapy. Right. So it, it took five years to move the bureaucracy and get people to say, and, and again, irony of all ironies, to make it normal and inclusive for males to have care, which is like, right. oh God, what am I, <laughs> what am I, am I fighting for? Of course. Right. Yeah. But, but I mean, obviously, you know, things have evolved and, you know, now we have trans care and, you know, all sorts mm -hmm. of things like that. But yes, no, we, we have evolved. We are now everybody has a pelvic floor so it's yeah of course health. yeah it's yeah. so funny though because it's like ingrained in your brain i remember it is i remember everything like it's just women's yep. health women's health women's health women's yep and so i even find it rolling off my tongue now and then being like that's not right <laughs> well okay <laughs> well let, now we will update you <laughs> eagles what are we doing why are we still calling it yeah so that's my third child very very long story short but <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, so, you know, when you're, when you're starting to, you know, get pregnant with your oldest and well, you got pregnant with your oldest and you, did you run through your pregnancy at all? Like, how did you figure no. out what to do? Okay. Um, so I do like, while I'm not, I'm no expert by any means, but I do feel like, uh, Actually, this is probably false. PTs are probably the worst. It's kind of like nurses. That we are. Like, yes. Oh my yeah. God, you're right. <laughs> like, I was say like, oh, we're smart about listening to our bodies. We're probably the opposite. But yeah, for this particular portion of my life, I was pretty smart. And yeah. um, I knew kind of the devastating after effects of if I were to push it too far. And so for me just kind of like, it was definitely hard. Um, I've talked about this on a couple of podcasts because it's like running is, has been part of my identity since I was 12 years right. old and athlete has been my identity my whole life. And so for that to just come to a screeching halt is something that's really difficult to kind of deal with. And I didn't at the time know enough about lifting. And now I, of course, like that's a big part of my my pregnancy plans, but yeah. at the time I didn't. And so I kind of just went straight to walking when things started to hurt around early on, like 12 weeks. Mm -hmm. And I think I made it maybe made it to 16 weeks of like light jogging, but then I like stopped. I was like, I'm not pushing through this. There's yeah. nothing to be gained yep. by running five miles when I'm 40 weeks pregnant. Like I yeah. just, there's nothing, no fitness to be gained. And so I just did lots of walks, which again, is awesome. It's great. But I do wish I lifted a little bit more. Um, I do wish I had like kind of more prep for my body um, yeah. in terms of recovery. And so I do think I did a good job of resting, but I didn't do a good job of like really investigating what I could set myself up for. Like I know a lot of people do pelvic floor PT prior to delivery. Yeah. I wish I did that. Um, but, but again, and, and this is where, you know, my, my kids are older They're My oldest is about to turn 12 in a couple of weeks. And we look back and we're like, oh, I wish I'd done that. The, even because your oldest is how old now? Four. Four. Okay. We weren't doing a lot of that even four years ago. And even when you look at the, yeah. the education on like lifting period in PT, like 
pelvic floor PTs and CrossFit, oh my God, we were like at each other's throats, like in the early, you know, 2013, that sort of thing. And now things are shifting over, like so many ortho PTs are doing strength and conditioning, you know, even running, shifting over and being like, hey, lifting heavy is good for performance. Like that tide was just starting to shift. And even in the post in the, in the pregnancy stuff, like you, we still don't have great data there. So it's, I, I always catch people and I'm like, don't, don't say woulda, coulda, shoulda, because yeah. there wasn't like, we weren't necessarily telling people to, to do that, that, that was a thing. Right. Um, but for you, I mean, like to, to, to get it all out there, like you were a state champ in high school. Yeah. Running and, and yeah. you ran in college. Like we're not talking like me that I'm like, yay. <laughs> I mean, we, I, I was that person that was like back in the pack that we would help score, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> Just as important. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, there, I was, they had to show some, they had to throw somebody in the 3000 so they could go off to the bathroom, you know, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I always, my coach was like, okay, everybody has to do a field event. And would mm-hmm. put me in shot put, and I'm like, I'm not a oh really shot God. putter. What? I would, I would ignore like first call, second call, third, totally ignore it. I'm like, oh, sorry, never heard it. <laughs> I was warming up for the 5K, <laughs> right? So for you, like, how did that feel when you're like, okay, I know I'm doing what's right, but like, I mean, my first, I ran till I think 18 weeks, and then I literally sat down a rock and cry because it hurt so much. Called my husband, I'm like, I can't do this anymore. And in your head, you're like okay, this is who I am, mm-hmm. but this is not is what's happening. Like, it's easy yeah. to, you know, kind of brush it off in retrospect, but like at the time, like, how did, how did you kind of navigate that? Yeah, not well. Okay. <laughs> no, that's fair enough. <laughs> oh, totally. I, so there's a lot that happened at the same time. So I got pregnant and say December, January in April, we moved from San Francisco back to Boston. Oh, that's um, a big deal. Yeah. Big deal. And so my entire community, my friend group, everything was in SF. And so that was really mo- even more difficult than I anticipated. Yeah. Um, so that happened. A family member uh, close to us was diagnosed with cancer. And mm. so we were navigating that. And luckily they're in Boston. So we were yeah. able to like contribute that way. But it was um, emotionally, you know, terrifying. And then, um, and then I definitely had like pre partum. Is that a thing? Yeah. Right? Wherever you want it to be. <laughs> before, before I gave her depression. Right. So yeah. like I, I, the, the couple months, like it was really like, going from SF where the weather is just kind of always yes. not ideal to a really hot, sticky summer. I'm eight, nine, 10 months pregnant. And oh. I just hate life. <laughs> I have no friends. I have no community and I'm not even running, which is like my number one stress. Yeah. So I just was in such a funk going into the birth. Yeah. And then here is like my first baby and yada, yada. And I'm supposed to be so happy. And I definitely struggled with postpartum depression, anxiety, whatever kind yeah. of ball you want to throw it into. Um, and I didn't even have the awareness of it until about 12 weeks postpartum. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it was just really hard. My, my first would refuse to nurse. He nursed for two days and then he just decided not to anymore. And we did everything. We had the lactation consultants and I was like completely fine with, um, with bottle feeding or yeah. love. Uh, but then that postpartum brain takes over and you're like, this is, and it just took over. Like yes. going to the birth, I was completely fine with formula feeding my baby. And then the postpartum hormones took over and it became the end of the you world. You lose your shit. Yeah. No, you yes. lose. Yes. Yeah. It's terrible. And yeah. so we went through that. I exclusively pumped for six months. I don't uh, recommend it to most, to most anyone. <laughs> if I hear a pump, like. Uh, still oh still like you go into like ptsd <laughs> yes. i mean people are incredible they do it for a year and i yeah but if it's affecting your mental health please stop yeah. like it's and there's so many studies now coming out about that like even the letdown from an artificial machine yeah. can be like stimulate the wrong part of your brain i mean it is wild so i was in the funkiest of funks and yeah so happy that I kind of had this awareness of it towards like 
about four to six months in yeah. because, and I was coming out of it and um, I was like in therapy. And then the second kid, I was like, I got this. I got on Zola. Yeah. I left the hospital. That's I so was smart. Great for meds. I was yeah. so much better. He also nursed without a problem. <laughs> Like it's amazing. It makes you how wonder like, how you had the second, right? You're like, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> my like, oldest oh my did God, not. He's so easy because he's like actually will eat. Right. Um, yeah, my oldest didn't, didn't. I was just sleep. happier. Yeah, Ugh. he didn't sleep five years of his life, and I was like, "You're lucky you have a sibling. Like you were freaking lucky." It's an actual miracle that you had a second. <laughs> well, you know what? You know what's funny though is like he needs to know where his people are. Like he was that kid that like he goes down to sleep and the second he hears like a, like anything move in the room, he's like, where are you go? Where, what, what's going on? So he's 12 now. Right. I love you, honey. If you're ever listening to this someday, um, <laughs> he still needs to know where his people are. Mm. He's also that kid that 41 and a half weeks refused to get out of my body. Like mm. we're going to have to drag him out when he's 18. Cause otherwise he's going to live in my basement. Cause he just wants to be with his people. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Which like part of me like absolutely loves and hopes for. <laughs> oh my God. So how did you like, you know, when did you, did you get back to running between the kids? Like how, how did that all play out? It did. So, um, sorry, I have a little bit of an unstable Wi-Fi situation, You're good. but we're good. Um, uh, so I gave birth to Jack at the end of September and I I had signed up for the Boston Marathon in April and it's kind of your classic, like first kid optimism. And I make a ton of jokes about this on my, in my social media now. Um, it's funny but, now at the time, maybe yeah. not so much. <laughs> but I will say there are people who do everything right and still they struggle with injury and whatnot. Then there are people who do nothing right and just get lucky. Yes. I'm kind of in the between. I, okay. I came back very slow. I didn't start running until about 12 weeks postpartum. And I came back okay. super slow. I did a lot of cross training. Mm -hmm. And the only thing I really focused on was like a long run every seven to 10 days. Okay. But I also am like very aware of luck because I've watched my friends do everything right and still struggle with like pelvic yeah. issues a year or two postpartum. And so yeah. I just am lucky. I'm lucky. I, yeah. and I also am like grateful that I didn't push it while I was pregnant because all of that weight that I had gained would have really put a lot of stress on my pelvic floor. So I will not say I bounced back. There was nothing. <laughs> there was nothing bouncing. <laughs> <my return. laughs> uh, takes me about 18 months to like lose the quote unquote baby fat. And that's still with like running, you know, yeah. 30 to 60 miles a week. Um, it's just the way my body operates and that's fine. I actually gain a lot of weight after I give birth for both. Oh, isn't that funny? Oh my gosh. It's like my body's like desperate. Oh, cause I also have trouble making milk. So like my body's like desperate to make milk. Oh, and also gosh. I'm like eating a lot of like high nutritiously fat right. foods. <laughs> and my body just like gains weight. I'm just going like, to go backwards. This. Oh my gosh. <laughs> now, now you mentioned you're like, all right, my goal is to do Boston. And this is, this is a question that I ask all of my clients because I have had people tell me postpartum, they're like, so I want to do Boston. And meanwhile, it's like, you know, September. Yeah. I have to ask, I'm like, have you done Boston before? <laughs> and I have had clients tell me, no, they've never done Boston before. And maybe they just want to do it. And I was like, okay, you know, that's not how it works, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> So for you, uh, you ran a marathon before you ran Boston before. Yes. Okay, great. Just to clarify. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, just to clarify. And uh, I'd run Boston a, a few times before. Okay. The only reason I wanted to do it again was one, I had qualified right before I got pregnant. Mm. And um, it felt like just something good to get me out the door. Yeah. And I had also assured myself, like, if you get injured, even slightly, don't do it. If right. you are not ready to do it, you're not going to do it. Yep. But it was just something to have on the calendar yeah. um, and to get me out that winter as I was like really in the depths of. It's hard to run in the winter. Yeah. But it like, it was so refreshing to like get out, get that cold air on my face, have a yep. reason to leave my house. Yes. Alone. Um, yes. Alone. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> it, it really was. It turned into like a really good thing, but it's yeah. not something I like recommend for people. Yeah. Like, sign up for a 5K a year after. Don't sign up for a marathon eight months or six months after. Um, but the race was great. I got, I ran a great 15 miles. <laughs> 15 to 26 was a, a little Lugger. bit of a struggle fast. As, as people who know the Boston course, that's when the hills start. And yeah. um, I actually was in like really decent shape to get through that first 15. <laughs> and then I kind of rolled my way to the finish line. It was, um, it was pretty brutal, but yeah, you finished. I did it. I did it. Okay. And I didn't end up with any injury after. And it was so funny because it was kind of like a homecoming. So I went to school in Boston. So this is a city that I consider home, but yeah. So I got across the finish line and I called my husband and I was like, what are you guys doing? He's like, I'm at the park. I'm like, cool. I'll just take an Uber home. Like it was so nonchalant. It kind of was like a, it was like a, a local 5k. Okay, so. We're just going to check that box and yeah, go totally. home. <laughs> so I like went home. I picked up a couple slices of pizza and like, just like chilled okay. out on the couch with my six month old. <laughs> I, I don't think everybody can say that they would just kind of chill out after a marathon with a six month old. That's pretty impressive. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> All right. But so the second one, I yeah. was like, I didn't have, I didn't do that to myself. I didn't have any goal. And I knew that coming back the second time would be harder because everyone says it is. So I was yeah. like, okay, I'll just go slower. And I don't think I built up to anything over 10 miles until maybe like 14 months postpartum. So yeah. it was a much different, slower, more intentional build. And um, was it, was it slower for you for, for what reasons? I mean, like, I mean, I can make assumptions, but for you just like, was it just more time and logistics like and that kind of stuff? Thing. Yeah. yeah. And I just, I'm just so adamant about going slow. I, yeah. I, especially after you experience your first one, you're like, I need to get back into it. I need to feel like myself. And there's no one yeah. who understands that more. Like it, you want to feel like you have your body and not yes. just in this aesthetic way. It's not a superficial thing. It's feeling like yourself. Like again, yourself. Yep. And that you're not just like this food truck. <laughs> so, so like, I understand that more than anyone, but um, I was just like, I, I realized after the first, okay, I ran a marathon six months postpartum. That's whatever. Like, and that, like, not like it's not something to brag about. I actually was like a little embarrassed by it. And then because I'm a PT. So the, but then I was like, um, wow, I, I have all the rest of my life to run. If that yeah. makes sense. Like it kind of, kind of came to me all at once of like, there's no reason to rush back. And so yeah. I put nothing on my calendar the first 18 months um, after my yeah. second. And I, it does feel like an eternity, but it actually felt completely normal. And then like life is just crazier after oh, the right. second. So. Yeah. No, and you've got two boys, right? So oh, yeah. yeah, no, that's, yeah. It's like God a bless wall. <laughs> Yeah, like the windows breaking. <laughs> yeah, well, I got, I got a daughter that's going to be the girl that like brings a lampshade to the party so she can dance on the table with a lampshade on her head. So <laughs> don't know where she got that, but <laughs> uh, and then her brother's going to rat her out. But um, no, I feel like with the first kid, there you feel like there's so much that you. And I don't know who we feel like we need to prove stuff to. Mm -hmm. And even with the kid, we're like, we want them to get to that next milestone and the next milestone. It's like, okay, what are they going to do next? And I got them get in this next thing so they can. And the second one, I just did not feel that way. And I knew she was going to be, I was like, you know, two and done. Um, I don't know if you're just in a better mental place or you're like, okay, I've, you know, you've, you've gone through the fire and you're, you know, reasonably okay. But now, oh my God, like I look back and I'm like, and I know it's such a cliche. People are like, oh, it goes so fast. And you're like, no, it doesn't. Yeah. It does. And I'm like, holy shit, how did I survive that? And there's still parts of me where I'm like, okay, my body still does not quite feel the same. And of course now, you know, knock, knock, perimenopause. You're like, crap, I don't want yeah. to more. <laughs> <laughs> Why are we always oh. changing? I know. And the, the cliches are exhausting and yes. I try my best not to say them to anybody else because no first time mother needs to hear it goes too fast. They're not sleeping. No. They're 
exhausted. They feel like it's the longest days of their entire life. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, That's why yeah, I wonder I with your, with your <laughs> I was going to say with your skits, I wonder when they start to become funny. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> like I was laughing my ass off at the Brooks one. I was like, Oh my god, that's hysterical! Because Wait, I which literally one? I have a few for Brooks. Oh, the this was smart? the um the the I think you started with like a mom and a hat or something, and then there's the baby and oh, it, yeah. you're when doing I all the perfect. The yes, yeah, <laughs> it was. Where okay, so where do these ideas like? How do you reach back and find those things that you know are going to be like? Oh my god, every mom ever is going to get this, like. <laughs> Oh my gosh. I was actually talking with a fellow comedian yesterday yeah. and kind of nailed it for me because we were talking about just kind of stand up or keynote speaking. Yeah. He goes, I, I ask the person who I'm speaking for, what is the greatest anxiety in the room? What are, cause it's, he usually does corporate gigs. And so okay. what are these corporate, you know, what are these employees? What are their biggest anxieties? And he yeah. goes, that's where my jokes start. And I was like, without even realizing that's what I'm doing. Like I'm taking right. the points that caused us the most anxiety, the most stress and just making a joke out of it kind of, because it's like those expectations, like the whole yes. base of motherhood is this unbelievable expectation that we put on ourselves and society puts on us to do it all. And, yeah. and so for us to just kind of sit back and laugh at ourselves and be like, Oh my God, what, what was I doing? Why, what, why was I, you know, but also like you completely understand why you were doing that. It was so yeah. that you feel like a human again. And so you like both feel for the person in the skit, like, Oh, she's just trying to get out the door for half an hour, just give her half an hour, but also like laughing at the lengths that we go to just to get out the door for half right. an hour. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, Oh my it's gosh. like funny and not. <laughs> well, and then there's the unscripted one where your neighbor films you trying to get out of your house after your marathon. And then God forbid, you've got to go back and get something because we never get to just leave the house. And be. which, which ended up on like a little like boost on the today show, which I was laughing about. I'm like, that's just like it in a nutshell. Like Lord knows we're trying to get out of the house and everybody is working against us. Everything's working against you. And there's no like running after you become a parent is not the same for physical reasons, but yeah. also just like your time needs. Like there's no, there's no recovery no. <laughs> after no. you do a long run. Like now I, when I trained for New York, I did my long runs at 5 a.m. on Mondays. And so Ooh. I would get home at 7, 7.30 and help my husband get the boys out the door for their day yeah. so that I could sit for eight hours on like a computer and do my work as opposed to on the weekend, do my long run and then right. have to go to the playground for eight hours. Yes. Which is like, so it's funny how like, you're like, yes, it's Monday. <laughs> I can sit down and not have to, care not have to go to a playground. <laughs> and with boys, if you don't go to the playground at least twice a day, you are going to be killed in I'll, your I'll home. Them, I'll pay for it. They won't be tired enough. I got to run those guys like dogs in my backyard. So, oh my God. well, it's, it's yeah. funny. Like, um, cause I, I work a, obviously a lot with, with newer moms and they're like, does this get better? I'm like, no, no, it really doesn't. And, and not to be a, you know, Debbie Downer, but um, I've, I've always wanted to do a half marathon. And, and even here in DC, like the weather, it's very icy here lots of times. So it's, it's hard to get like a run in and I'd rather be skiing anyway. But um, so I finally got a coach this year and we're in this group and I'm like, okay, I do CrossFit two mornings a week. Oh, nice. I, I can do long runs. That's what hip FAI surgery and adding some load will do. Mm -hmm. um, you, ne you need to get that weight on. Um, and I'm like, all right, I can do longer runs Friday, Sunday, um, I got to get something else in there. What do I do? And so I put it on this group and this um, lovely girl, and I, I, I don't think she has kids, but she's a PT. And she's like, so maybe you get a run in before CrossFit. And I'm like, I get up at 440. How much, how much earlier can I? <laughs> I'm like, I can't, I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh my gosh, I know. And like literally at, oh, I don't know, say about 235, 
No, actually, I lie. It's it's three thirty five. At three thirty five, I like I take off my whatever I did for work hat, and then I have I have the chauffeur hat that I put on. Yeah, and then, <laughs> and then I just go straight until eight thirty. Oh my gosh, all the activities, all, all of it. Long. And sometimes you can, you know, like sometimes if my daughter's in choir, there's a trail nearby and it's light, and I'm not going to be killed. Right. I'll take take the dog for you know a walk and or go for a run or something like that. Sometimes you can work it out, but I'm like, no, it does not get easier. <laughs> it just, right, it just changes up how you uh exactly how you manage it. I suppose. exactly, but yeah. um, so I, I say that not to be a Debbie Downer. It's just, but I think the sooner you get realizing like okay it's not gonna look Mm -mm. like this beautiful thing on paper it's gonna look like 5 a.m monday morning (laughs) yeah yeah it's so interesting um and then i did a a video recently with the professional marathoner sarah vaughn she runs yes she's amazing and she has four kids that are like in a pretty big range like a toddler up to high school yeah then um uh a full-time job she's a real owner And so it's wild. I do not understand how she does it all and still runs like a 228 marathon or something like that. Um, And someone recently said to me, a man, he goes, I do not understand how moms compete against non-moms like professionally. I'm like, that's so true. Like, of course they don't need to be like, you know, in a separate category, but like, at least in like your respect for them, it's just unbelievable how they're able to like, just even logistically get all the stuff in the lifting, the prehab, the rehab, the no. all the stuff. It's unbelievable. And a lot of them work. And so well, and um, I would hire them all day long because you know, they know how to get shit done. Like my management is unbelievable. Well, and, and, <laughs> I, I think the thing that's so interesting is we're, we're starting to get, you know, at least I, we're having these conversations about moms who are postpartum athletes and we're seeing it in the elite. I mean, Steph Ruth, she's going out for another year. Did you see that? I, I'm like, dang girl, get it. Yeah. Um, but like, I think we're just seeing more moms perform and just push that boundary. And it's so inspiring, but you're still wondering like, how, how far can we go? Mm-hmm. You know? And, but cause you know how much that takes, you yeah. know how much it takes and you know the toll and you, but you also know that there's a huge support system behind them and that more moms need that. Um, right. But I, it, it's, it's just a really interesting time. Um, I think to be in like the postpartum world and sport and that sort of thing. Um, yeah. For you, you put these reels out. I'm sure you're getting a lot of DMs and a lot of comments and that sort of thing with the mom related ones. Like what are the, do you get people that like share stories with you or be like, Oh my God, you know, and, and give you crazy comments? Like what, what stuff are you getting back? To be honest, not that much. I, a lot of like, this is me type deal, but <laughs> nothing, nothing okay. wild. Uh, I, I have like a pretty tame. <laughs> oh, you don't get anybody trying to, to get you to diagnose them. <laughs> A little bit, but to be honest, most people don't know I'm a PT, which helps. <laughs> okay, we'll keep that on the D. We'll keep that on the I mean, DL. Or just say, like, "Oh, you're a cute care." You don't. <laughs> right. I went to Vermont with my parents, and they're like, "My knee hurts. My wrist hurts. What do you think about this?" And I'm like, "I don't know. Unless you had a stroke, I'm not quite sure I can even help you anymore." Like I have, like I've been out of school for. 12 plus years <laughs> they haven't taken a continuing ed class on uh, an ortho you know so right. like i'm sorry that your knee hurts do quad sets like <laughs> Best thing you can ever do is have a friend and delegate it out. That's what I've done with my family. My family, they're actually on the West Coast and um, they they retired. They live in their RV. And I have um, a dear friend who she just takes care of them. And wow. my dad's had Parkinson's for 20 years. And so I can say all the right things and they still think I'm 13. Yeah. Um, like the, the, the cervical they think I treat is not this, you know, down there. It's like up here. <laughs> my mom still thinks I treat ankles. I don't know. Um, so they don't listen to me anyway. <laughs> so I'm like, right. Hey, meet my friend. <laughs> and they, they, she's, she's great. She takes care of it. I'm like, totally. delegate out. <laughs> <laughs> my parents are a combo they'll I'll like give them advice and then they'll give me 10 excuses why they can't do that yeah. and then 
if I say, okay, well, this isn't my specialty. I don't really know what else to tell you. They say, well, don't you have your doctorate? Like, why'd you go to school? <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. I was like, I'm, I'm an internet comedian now. <laughs> <laughs> have, have you got comments from that from your parents? Yeah. Like, we spent all this money and this They're is what you're doing. They are pretty disturbed by <laughs> So you are not the only PT comedian. There was a guy I connected with, I think his last name is Quasto. That he he went to, so I went to, they keep changing the name. It used to be University of Sciences in Philadelphia. St. Joe's just bought it. And so I, I forget, like, a friend of mine has a, a, a podcast and highlighted him. And he said where he went to school. And he's, like, making it as a comedian. And I'm like, oh, funny. It's, it's like a thing. It's a thing. It's a thing. So, but yeah. I do think that, like, PT is quite honestly, like, it's almost like we have to do a side entertainment show anyway <laughs> when you're treating people. It's, I mean, well, that's how, it's funny how this has kind of like evolved. It started, I mean, I used to have a podcast and I always used to say I was good at interviewing people, interviewing, interviewing people because of being a PT. Yeah. You interview people all day long, all day long, whether yep. it's about their medical stuff, but then it always goes into like, you know, socioeconomic, or, you know, all anecdotes about their life, trying yeah. to gather all the clues, yes. right? And so- there's that. And then like, you're just talking to people nonstop. Yes. And so then it turned into video and I have a video business where I was doing legacy videos. And so I would interview people all about their life and it just kind oh, of wow. felt like another day of work because that's also what I did, you know, yeah. like I'm treating you at the hospital because you had a fall recently and we run out of things to talk about. I ask you where you're from. What's your family? That, you know? and, then, yeah. and then people go off and they tell me while we're walking down the halls of the hospital, you know, um, yeah. how they served in Vietnam. And so it's just, it was, it's been like a pretty like uh, smooth transition, yeah. I guess, even though it's a completely different field from PT. Yeah. What I'm doing is not any different from PT. You know, It, it really isn't. It really isn't. That's why I love it. And, and I love like, I, I love when people kind of find that creative aspect, you know, and, and knowing how hard it is to pull ideas like that out, but like pull from your experience and pull from your, your clients and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Like, it's so cool that you've been able to kind of mash all this stuff up um, and then just make people freaking laugh. Like, quite honestly, yeah. it's been a shit show of a couple of years. We could all use a few laughs. I'll <laughs> use a little bit of laughter. <laughs> Especially moms who have had kids in this pandemic. Oh my God. Like, you know, yeah. it just, it's just a thing. So, so for you, is this, you're, you're just like, all right, bye PT. We're done. Um, uh, and we're going to give this I'll a go. Or? Done. I'll never be done. But I, so what, how I said I was a traveling PT. Mm -hmm. What Erica, my friend Erica and I would do is we would, so like initially we went to Chicago and we had an amazing summer in Chicago and then we went to SF and then we went and traveled in India and Nepal for six months. Oh my like, gosh. So That's that amazing. was like our routine and we would take a couple jobs and then we would go to Turkey and Greece for a while. Like wow. we... I like look back at me and I'm like, yes, Laura, good job, Erica. You know, like we crushed it in our twenties yeah. um, and we paid off our loans fast because you yeah. make so much money as a traveler. And so we just had a ball. And so um, I've always taken those breaks is what I'm yeah. saying. Is like, and then like, I, I've always had per diem jobs. Like my, most of my home health was per diem. So like when I would take breaks, like postpartum, like they're unpaid, which is heart wrenching. I mean, Massachusetts now pays a little bit, but and so to California, but it's, it's hard, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. But I would just be like, well, I'm not making any, like the first baby I went, at, went back after three and a half months. And the second baby, I was like, ah, maybe yeah. six months, seven months. Cause it's like, yeah. whatever at this point, like, yeah. Yeah. Child care costs so much in Boston that it kind of just evens out. <laughs> My brother and sister-in-law live outside of Boston as well. And they've got three kids and trying to make all that stuff work. So yeah, no, no, no. It's wild. It's yeah. wild. And yeah. I know it's expensive in many places. Um, yeah. 
And I'm also just really privileged to have a husband who has a good job. And so it gives me the opportunity to stay yeah. home a little bit longer. I know some people have to go back after like three weeks. And so yeah. um, lucky in that sense. But also I was never destined to be a stay at home mom. I, they have an incredible amount of patience that I just don't think exists in Mm-mm. my body. Um, wait, wait till you meet the professional PTA mom. Oh my gosh. Wow. You will. And I can't wait to see that skit. Yeah. Um, those are those, we have a lot of them here, um, that they had high powered jobs and now they take all that that, purpose and and become the president of like the preschool PTA. And then they carried on in elementary school. And at first I was like incredibly intimidated. And because I unfortunately one time signed up to, you know, be in charge of like kindergarten, Halloween or something and god forbid I forgot the orange slices and the water on the list or something and anyway point being these moms make my children's lives better because they organize everything they have these cool parties they make sure they make sure the orange slices are there because I clearly can't handle that and all I have to do is click click Venmo and I'm like boom yeah That's incredible. I love them. I love them. I'm like, I'm so glad you took that purpose and put it towards something that makes my child's life better. So you probably live somewhere similar to Cambridge. So Cambridge is like, at least the part that I live in is like incredibly overeducated. Yes. (laughs) Um, So our kids go to a daycare. It's your classic run of the mill daycare. There is nothing about it. That's like for exceptional kids. There's like, you know, it's, throw your kids into a room daycare and it's a nonprofit and all of the parents on the nonprofit have PhDs, all of Mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm not even qualified to be on this board. (laughs) So I only have my clinical doctorate. So (laughs) they look down at you. (laughs) We laugh at like our neighborhood in general, like uh, our next door neighbor is in Biden's cabinet and I make that's pretty much like here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So no, I- it's pretty much, that's pretty much like here. Um, yeah. yeah. And I, I get to joke about it and, and, you know, it, it, it's funny how that stuff comes in with the work that I do. And even with runners too, because ever you know, people that are very, very, um, focused, mm-hmm. um, is a nice way to put it. Uh, there's a correlation. I think this, I have a theory that they have overactive pelvic floors because we're all here. Right. Oh, I bet that. <laughs> um, and I get to say that because I've lived here now longer than I lived in New York state. And both of us are from New York state. Um, I've lived here over 20 years now. And I'm like, you know what? I think I earned this that I can say that, you know, if you live here, it's for a reason. And then my second question when I ask people is where they're from, because if you're from North Jersey, if you're from downstate, if you're from Boston, there's a little bit different musculoskeletal strategy than if you're from like South Dakota. Not to say there's anything wrong with one or the other, but we're we're not so mellow on the East Coast. <laughs> not so mellow. Not so, mellow. <laughs> so that's my theory. You've heard it here that like where you're from dictates a little bit of your pelvic floor and your muscular strategies. And, and that might play in a lot of other things. So. I agree. I agree. And your and the makeup of your, your PTA on your yes. preschool. See, yeah. I just put a nice thread through the whole thing. See, there it's we all go. connected. It's all connected. Okay. It's so true. <laughs> I mean, it is though. So for you to wrap up, like you've had this amazing experience. You've got a couple of kids, you're back running, you're able to kind of tie all this stuff together. Um, You're able to kind of look back and make fun of things. Like what is one thing that you wish you could tell pregnant Laura before she was about to go through all this stuff? When, what, what's one thing that you would tell her um, if you could now? Um, Get help Um, Mm. and get help early um also like educate the people in your life to help you Mm. help help you so like my husband's amazing and he would support me in any way yeah but he didn't know to encourage me to get on medication right because he just didn't know um I'm such an advocate for getting on something like helping your mental health in any way and not just kind of like riding it out and seeing how it goes because what happens so often to me and then my close friends 
you spiral and you don't know that you're yeah. in it. And so I, I look back to like my postpartum with my first and I didn't even know I was in it because I was still smiling. I still laughed every once in a while. He was giving me stretches of like four or five hours of sleep. I should be fine, you know? And like, just because I wasn't crying all day, every day does not mean that I was okay. And yeah. because I had no previous um, mental health struggles, I had no idea. I just had right. no idea what to look for. Connor didn't know what to look for. And um, the second time around, he was just so much more well-versed in checking in yeah. and making sure that like, okay, like, are you, you feeling well-supported? Yeah. Um, because like all the physical stuff, like I can say like, it, you know, it will get better and take your time. Right. And while I do advocate for that, it's like, it's almost like you have to live it first. That's like how we were yep. talking first to second baby. Like you do have to stress about your baby's milestones. It's a rite of passage. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. nothing I say will make you not worried if the baby is not crawling at a year. You know, it's like. <laughs> Although they, they got rid of crawling. Did you see that? Oh, no, I didn't. That's no, good. you can go right. You can go right up now. They skipped that. Yeah, so okay, it, okay, you're right. good. You're good. <laughs> um, Just rest. But yeah, I. I think that like that stuff is kind of like, it's easy to kind of let go off. Yeah. But like, I think like really getting your ducks in a row with your mental health prior to delivery is, yeah, would have helped me so much. And hearing like a couple of my friends after I had my first tell me, oh yeah, I just go right on medication from the time I leave the delivery room. I was like, wait, you can do that? Like I had no wow. idea. And right. I was like, oh, that sounds awesome and something I would love to set myself up for because it takes a couple of weeks yep. to ramp up anyways. And so anyways, I'm not saying everyone needs to be on meds, but I do think that it's an amazing opportunity to, for I, us to like level think, out, you know, that's so important. And, and, and again, like, I, I think it, it shouldn't be understated that like now when you talk to friends are like, Oh yeah, no, this. And, and I think that's the thing people don't realize right. is yeah you make all these assumptions about how everybody else is getting through stuff. And then sometimes it's not until you're in it and you say something that then you start to realize it's kind of like miscarriage in that respect. It's like, yeah. you don't realize how many people have miscarriages until you go through it. And then you mention to somebody that it happened. If you don't talk about it, if you don't raise your hand and be like, Hey, something's up here. You never realize that all that stuff is there. So, and, and to have somebody by your side advocating with you, um, that's such a, a great recommendation too. And it, yeah. it being a mom's hard. <laughs> it's just it's hard. hard. <laughs> but it doesn't have to be this black hole of misery either, you know? Perfect. Like I yeah. I would feel like um when Julian, my second, when he would have like these crying fits, those mm -hmm. used to trigger me with Jack and make me feel like he's never gonna stop crying. And that was yeah. the anxiety, right? It was like, yeah, why won't he stop crying? He's never going to stop crying. I'll never hear silence ever again. <laughs> And you think that you do. Yeah, you do. You do. You're like, this is it. I'm never going to be silent. And then Julian, and I don't know, if, like, again, I don't know if it was the meds or the experience or the fact that he was a completely different baby or whatever. But um, I do think it helped contribute in a positive way. And of just being like, oh, no, he'll stop eventually. Yeah. Or, you know, like pass him off to the husband. I'm going to go outside for 10 minutes. I'm just going to take a lap. <laughs> And so feel you know, okay and not I guilty did. about it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome advice. I love it. All right. If you want to find more about Laura Green and you want to um, laugh, <laughs> you can find her over on Instagram at Laura McGreen. And I can't wait to see, I like anytime, like I get little notifications like, all right, she's got a new one. I'm like, I can't wait. I'm super excited. <laughs> so I can't wait to see where you go from I, I try and do two a week. Sometimes. Okay. All right. But then that's how I'm going to start like my day. It's Tuesday, Thursday scene. I yeah. like it. All right. Now that I'm going to play my whole day around this now, right after yeah. concert. Right? <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for being on. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. It was a joy.